This is Dream Chasers, episode 55, with Jeff Berwick. Hey guys, what's going on? I'm Adam Carswell, and welcome to Dream Chasers, interviews with the future. On Dream Chasers, we interview individuals with supernatural amounts of potential based on early success in their careers. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's get straight to the interview. Hey guys, this is Adam Carswell, and today I'm joined by Jeff Berwick. Jeff is the founder of Anarchapulco. He's originally from Edmonton, Canada, went to college for roughly a month, and then they kicked him out. And now Jeff lives in Acapulco, Mexico. Jeff, thanks for being on the show. And do you have any opening remarks for our listeners? Hey, Adam, great to be on. Um, just mentioning that I'm, I'm in uh, Honduras right now, Roatan, Honduras. So I've been traveling around. I just came from El Salvador and uh, on my way to Ecuador, actually. That's wow. where I'm at right now. Nice. And is it a business trip? I always say everything's ha- uh, half business, half pleasure. Uh, I'm with my wife. Uh, we're actually in a beautiful resort here in Honduras. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing some things. Uh, there's a, some sort of free sort of uh, startup city sort of things going on here. So I'm here to check that out as well. Uh, and then in Ecuador, I'm going to be interviewing a few people uh, for, for my show, Anarchast. So uh, like everything I do in my whole life, it's always a bit of business and a bit of pleasure. Yeah, and I'm curious, El Salvador, Honduras, obviously, reputation-wise, not the countries you would think of when it comes to technology. So have you been impressed or excited about anything that is going on there? Well, I didn't spend much time in El Salvador. I was just there last night. Uh, I actually sank my boat there about 15 years ago, so I haven't been, hadn't been back since. Uh, so I didn't really see a lot in El Salvador on this trip. Uh, I'm here in uh, Honduras for a few days, but I just got here a few hours ago. So, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, not a lot to uh, comment on either at the moment, although I will say that, uh, you know, this big uh, immigration crisis that they talk about and having to build this giant wall. And what's that gang they talk about? They say it's a El Salvador gang, like MI-13 or something. I have no idea. That? No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's total BS as always. Like, I'm like, where is this gang at? You know, it's totally nice in both places here in Honduras and in El Salvador. Uh, Just the typical propaganda on television. Yeah, I'm sure we can get into uh, talking about some of that today here, too. And then one thing that you just brought to my attention that you that you mentioned um, with with everything, that the immigration wars or whatever. um, I think listening to your show was the first place that I ever heard the concept that the wall could actually be a way to keep Americans in rather than keeping other people out. And I just love that perspective because no one's talking about that. Yeah, absolutely. The U.S. is in a state of collapse. The U.S. dollar is going to collapse. It is right now one of the least free countries in the world. Uh, When it all collapses and the U.S. dollar goes down, it's going to be pretty bad in the U.S. And every time that's happened in history, usually what happens is the government gets really oppressive. Uh, People try to escape. Uh, You know, that's happened in the Soviet Union when it was collapsing. It's happening right now in Venezuela. So when that happens in the U.S., uh, that wall, if they do build it, I I saw that they spent $2 billion so far and it built a mile and a half of the wall. Typical government uh, uh, stuff, total BS. And uh, it's not like that wall would ever stop anyone anyway. I don't know if you've ever heard of things called ladders or (laughs) or the fact that it's surrounded by oceans on both sides and you can just swim around it you know in some ways it it definitely could be more to keep americans in than to keep others out yeah and and so guys let's get some context here on jeff too before you start thinking he's just some guy talking about the uh the wall and and americans getting trapped in there Jeff's track record is pretty impressive and i'm going to actually have you uh shed a little bit of light on it as well because i don't know all the details but i know you started a company there during the dot-com boom that did very well. Um, it still exists to this day. I believe you, you exited. I, I don't know how many subscribers you have now on YouTube, but it's, I think, probably close to 200,000, if not more. I mean, you've, you've, you've done a lot. And if you don't mind, please, please brag about yourself here for a little bit, some other things that you've been able to do throughout your career. Yeah, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Uh, you mentioned that I got kicked out of college. Uh, my mom signed, made me go to college. I was so mad because she made me finish high school as well to get my badge of obedience. And I, I <laughs> re- re- barely went at all in the last few years. I actually did a deal with the principal just to go for the test. And then when I got out, my mom said, oh, you have to go to college. And, you know, I was 18 years old and I didn't know. And I was like, okay, I guess, but I totally don't want to do this. I totally want to just go and make some money somewhere. 
uh, and, and move out of where we lived in, in one of the coldest places on earth in Edmonton, which I call Edmonton, Canada. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I looked at the college courses and I couldn't get into any like major universities or anything because I'm on purpose tried to get 50% in every course in high school, uh, just enough to get the badge of obedience and just get out of there. Uh, so I got accepted to a community college in Edmonton and I signed up for something called uh, media and advertising. And it's kind of interesting because I'm still in the media business today. Uh, and they kicked me out after one month. And this is back in 1988. And there was a, they had these little Mac uh, computers with that little tiny green screen. And the guys uh, who were teaching the course were all like, yeah, we're the top media guys in Canada. We're the best. They were so full of themselves. <laughs> and, uh, but they didn't even know how to turn the computers on. I'm like, you guys are complete idiots. You don't know anything. And they're like, well, this all new stuff. And I'm like, well, why am I even here? You don't know anything about like the future. And uh, they ended up kicking me out. And it's kind of funny because basically about 10 years from the day I got kicked out of the media course in college, I had a uh, media company called Stockhouse Media Corporation worth $240 million uh, during the tech bubble. Uh, and then it, that all uh, crashed afterwards. And I went on, I went on to actually discover how uh, central banking works and how er everything works. I actually tried to sail around the world on my sailboat. I actually sank it in El Salvador uh, in uh, Jicalisco Bay in 2005. And, uh, and I just traveled from, uh, from there. But um, and then I ended up deciding to start the Dollar Vigilante in 2010. I also started my podcast called Anarchast in 2010. And that's kind of led to uh, our conference in Acapulco, which just had our uh, fifth one this year in Acapulco, Mexico. So, yeah, I'm I've, I've sort of an entrepreneur and I travel around a lot and, and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's what we're going to get into here in a second. Um, one more question with that. How did, how did you sink your boat? Did you, did you hit a rock or, or what happened? <laughs> Uh, I was actually um, coming from Guatemala, and I, I thought the currents were really the the the, uh, the current was so strong that I thought it was going to take one or two days to get to El Salvador, but it took like four or five days. And there's a lot of storms along the way, and I was exhausted. And I was coming into a bay where there was up the river was a marina, and they said, "Don't come in. It's too late. The sun's about to go down. It's kind of like there's shallow areas in the bay." Uh, and I was like, I'm exhausted. I just want to go in. And as soon as I started to enter the bay, a massive storm hit, like the, the craziest tropical storm I've ever seen in my life. The lightning was so intense. It looked like daylight. It was like one after another, like five things, five lightning strikes per second, all wow. hitting my mast. All of a sudden it was just, I was in a washing machine for basically a couple of hours on the boat. And the person I was with, who was my ex-girlfriend at the time, who thought she was going on a really leisurely sailing trip. <laughs> with martinis and stuff uh, she came up from down below and she said the boat's filling up really fast with water and so what had happened is we kept hitting the bottom in this bay over and over until finally the boat cracked and, and uh it started to fill up with water and then we had to swim in basically did you think did you think uh at any point like this is it did you think you were gonna die uh, there was one point I was, we were still in this major storm and we were up to about here with water and I said, okay, it's time for us to get off the boat. Um, and she, she didn't want to get in the water. So I put her on my surfboard and we went to push off and the wave pushed us back onto the boat. And you know how they have the stanchions all along the boat, those like metal rods. And we ended up in between, like got thrown into the boat and one was here and one was here. And I was like, holy cow. This is serious. Wow. If we don't put, like the next time I push off this boat, we better get away from it or we're going to get impaled on one of these rods. And so I just waited. And as soon as the wave hit, I kicked off and I, I battled my legs so hard that they both seized up, but we got away from the boat. And once we were away from the boat, everything's okay. Like okay. that's the problem with boats. You know, it's like uh, if you get close to land, that's where you have problems. And if you get thrown into the boat, that's when you have problems. And one time a propane tank flew right by my head. Uh, so there was a couple of moments there where I was like, okay, this is pretty serious. I better pay attention here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then we got, got away from the boat and then we were fine. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's a, that's a good story there. <laughs> um, so that, that sounds like almost as much fun as what you've been doing with Anarchapulco. So um, I have to ask you, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, said you mentioned you've been doing it for five years. Everyone listening now hopefully is intrigued and wants to know what is Anarchapulco. So Let's step into, as I like to call it, the next level chamber.
when did you realize an Acapulco was something you wanted to take to the next level? Uh, well, I'll say how it started. I was going to a number of freedom events in the U.S., things like Freedom Fest and uh, Pork Fest, and um, there used to be one called Libertopia. And every time I'd come back, I'd complain. I'd go, oh, man, why do they have these freedom conferences in the U.S.? It's like one of the least free places in the world. I'd always get kidnapped by people in blue costumes because I was drinking a drink outside the bar or something along those lines. <laughs> And someone posted on Facebook, they said, well, if you, if you don't like it so much, why don't you start your own Liberty event? And why don't you start it there where you live in, in Mexico? And I just laughed because I was like, well, you know, first of all, it's going to be an anarchist event. And uh, there really wasn't a ton of anarchists back five, six years ago. It was very small. And so I was like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if there's enough anarchists to make it work. Plus, we're going to host it in what the CIA calls the fourth most dangerous city in the world in Acapulco, Mexico. It's totally not, but CIA is right. always just lie lies. I was like, I don't see how this could possibly work. But I am an entrepreneur, so I thought, all right, let's post up. Uh, I, I paid someone half a Bitcoin at the time, which is about 300 bucks. It's now about $4,000. Uh, <laughs> for the name, I said, what's a cool name? And someone came up with an Arcapoco, and I thought, that's pretty good. Uh, always like uh, different sort of sounding names. Posted a website, and uh, we sold about 70 tickets uh, with about a week left until the event. So I was like, oh, man, this is a disaster. 70, that's not very many people. Uh, we're, we're definitely not going to make any money. We're probably going to lose some money. And, but at the last minute about another 50 or so showed up so we ended up with about 120 130 people the first year it was a total disaster in many ways uh, i was drunk the whole time uh, i was very <laughs> depressed i was actually very suicidal back then i'd just gone through two business failures and uh but the people loved it and uh, at the end uh, we had a bit of a q a and we said asked some questions and one person said are you going to do this again next year and I said, I don't know. Uh, it's a lot of work, and we're obviously not making much money. It's only about 120 people. Uh, but then I decided, okay, let's try it one more time. And the next year, we, we more than doubled to about 300 people, and it really um, uh, did very well. Uh, people just absolutely loved it. And so I thought, okay, I could see like some potential here. Uh, so uh, from that point on, we just continued. Then the next year, doubled again to about 600 people. And then the next year, it doubled again to about 1,200 uh, people. Uh, and then uh, this year, it was uh, almost a double of about 2,000 people. So, uh, and now it's a real thing. Now it's like something I actually uh, pay attention to and <laughs> like spend time on and stuff like that. But at the very beginning, uh, there was no intention or no, you know, I didn't know if it would work out at all. But uh, now it's become a pretty major thing. Yeah, yeah, very major. I know a lot of people now that have been to it. And I, I don't think I even first heard about it until maybe the third one there that you mentioned. I know it's something that's still on, definitely on my bucket list. And hopefully now that we're having this conversation, I'll see you there next year. I guess tell us about watching it grow now. I, I know if I was doing an event, I'd be concerned to the point where like once it goes so mainstream, are people going there still obtaining that, that inside value that they, you know, that they really want? I know you've actually been able to set up other conferences around an Arcapulco now. So do you kind of see it as what's going to draw people in now and bring people to these other informational sessions? Or do you still think that the primary value right, lies right there at Anarchapulco? Well, Anarchapulco is the main focus for sure. And um, you're right in saying that when you have something grow so big, uh, so fast, that it's really hard to keep it kind of feeling how it did at the beginning. And that's been the, the, one of the toughest parts, but I think we did a pretty good job of it. Uh, we brought in a new management team this year, and there was definitely some problems uh, with the new management team because they hadn't done it before. Uh, but in general, uh, it, I think it went really well. Uh, I think I'd have to say, like, I talked to almost everyone at the event, even though it's 2,000 people, but I'm there. It's about five days, so I'm there all the whole five days. I end up talking to most people, and almost everyone says it's life-changing, the best event they've ever attended, uh, these sort of things i've never heard anyone say they didn't like it and um you know that's the real key is is keeping it even as we grow keeping the real uh vibe the, the way it has been even when it was smaller uh and we're trying to bring in uh, more people sort of a committee of people who've been around since the beginning for next year uh just to make sure because we might um, we might be over three thousand people next year and you know as you grow it just gets harder and harder to keep that kind of vibe that we used to have the one thing i can say about it is that every single person attending is a voluntarist or an 
an anarchist. And uh, when we're all in the same place, we get along super well. Like it's all like people tell me, like I've heard this so many times. The best thing about an Arcapoco is the other people who go there and then you get to meet these other people. Many of these people come from places like a small town in the U.S. or, or New York City or Chicago or actually it's from everywhere in the world people come. But very few people get to hang around like-minded people like themselves. They hang around a lot of status, a lot of people who are like big Trump supporters or big Obama supporters. And and for people like us, that's just really irritating. It's like, you know, we're not interested at all in this political stuff. And so when you get around like-minded people, uh, it just, it's, it's just so refreshing to most people. Many people say it's like the one week of the year where they, they really can be themselves. They can enjoy themselves. Uh, they can have great conversations and things like that so so in that sense uh, even as we grow I don't think we're going to um, you know it's not going to get too like where people don't like it anymore I think it just becomes a matter of you know how do we make it so you still get a chance to meet a lot of the speakers and things like that because as you get into thousands and thousands of people it gets harder but we had over a hundred and some speakers I think over 150 speakers this year uh, and almost all the speakers this is another cool thing about the conference I go to a lot of conferences myself and it's very rare that you actually get to hang around and hang out with the speakers at like at the bar or at pool or whatever. And our event, almost all the speakers stay all week and you can just go and meet them wherever and, and just uh, it's very relaxed and casual. So, um, yeah, but that's going to be a, one of our biggest issues is as we continue to grow, keeping it so it, it's still cool and fun. Right. And I'm, I'm curious about you mentioned how it is for you. I'd imagine as this thing continues to grow, it might be kind of difficult for you to be there every day. You know, you're, you're Jeff Berwick. Everyone wants to talk to the, the creator. Is that something that um, after a while you're like, oh man, I just can't wait to get home right now. Or, or I don't know what, what goes through your head in times like that. Well, the first uh, few years, actually I've been, I've been working on myself a ton. So I used to drink a lot. Like I said, I went through these major business problems. I was basically hey, bankrupt. Ac- about actually, years. yeah, real quick. Um, because you're, you're going, you're going to start talking about this. It just reminded me, um, and you still do this sometimes, but your, your walk and talk videos, even recently I've, I've begin, begun doing my own and someone reached out to me and they were like, Hey, your videos uh, remind me a lot of, of Jeff Berwick's. I don't know if you, you know who he is. I'm like, Oh my goodness. That's like, one of the greatest compliments I could have ever had. That's, that's who kind of like inspired me to do this. So, sorry, uh, you said you've been working on yourself. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool that uh, you're, you're doing your own thing. That's why I want a lot of people to do is get out there and do your own thing as well. But yeah, I've been working on myself tons. So in the first few years I was just drinking like crazy. I don't really even remember a couple of years of the conference. Uh, and then, um, and a big part of it too was I wasn't all that comfortable in social situations. People might be surprised to hear that, but when I go to a conference and I get surrounded by people, it's it's not all that comfortable. But I've worked on myself so much that this year I didn't drink too much, uh, and I was able to just enjoy uh, being around all these people all week. Uh, I've learned also how to take care of myself, so I'll go for a massage or I'll go uh, away for a while for dinner with just a few friends or with my wife at night, just to kind of get away from it all. But uh, no. It's, it's actually, it's very enjoyable, actually. Like, now I can totally enjoy it now. And uh, and just like everyone else who enjoys it because the other people are so interesting and so cool, uh, it's the same for me. I meet so many amazing people that entire week that it's definitely not a burden at all. It's just, it's just a matter of do you have enough energy to make it through the whole week? And I've got enough of a physical regimen now and I have vitamins and all kinds of things that I do um, that, uh, that I can actually make it through the week. But it, by the end of the week, yeah, I'm pretty excited. Exhausted. I, I I said this year that uh, I I need at least two weeks to recover from it, but it turned out to be about a month. Uh, <laughs> it just trying to you, you go through it, it's just an a crazy intense week, and it takes a while to recover from it. Yeah, and uh, you just mentioned also taking your your health to a new level. I've been watching you too, taking your spirituality to a new level. What are some daily things that you're doing now that you feel like you probably weren't doing um, at the beginning of an Arcapulco and maybe early in your life that you're like, wow, I'm happy this is a part of my routine now? Oh, man, like there's so many things. I've changed everything in my life. Um, you know, from the moment I get up now, I'm doing health related things. I have a, something called a Beamer. I don't know if you've even heard of that. It's B-E-M-E-R. It's like a mat that you lie on. It gets your blood circulating better. Um, I do that. Then I do a coffee enema, uh, meditation, yoga. And this is all before I even start my day, like work day. Um, gym, eating good. 
I've, you know, I rarely smoke at all anymore. I, I think the last time I smoked was a month or two ago. Uh, sometimes I'll smoke every now and then on a trip. Uh, I right. don't hardly ever drink to the point where I'm drunk anymore. I think the last time was, it's been months at least. Uh, I might have a couple drinks at dinner or something like that. Massages, a lot of spa stuff. Uh, really what it is, is taking care of myself. And it's something that I didn't even know is something you should even try to do until a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, so a bunch, I know I hang out with a lot of hippies. I mean, going to Ecuador afterwards to hang with some hippies and do some <laughs> other interesting hippie kind of stuff. And uh, they're always like, you know, you got to learn to love yourself. And I was like, love myself? Like, what a weird, strange idea. Like, I've never heard that <laughs> idea in my life. And, uh, and really, that's what it is. It's, it's taking care of yourself. Uh, and it was something that I just didn't even know you should be trying to do. And now that I'm doing it, it's awesome. Because, like, I would never, like, I'd always actually be hard on myself. I'd always work, overwork myself. I'd never, like, take care of myself, right? And, and really, just having that mental switch to a point where I, I'm like, oh, I have to take care of this guy every day. Like, I want to take care of my dogs. I want to take care of my wife. I want to take care of my kids. I want to take care of my friends. But it really, if I don't take care of myself, I can't do any of that. And so it's really just like, uh, you know, it's almost like thinking of myself as, as a different person that I really care about. And it's like, well, if you really care about that person, let's take care of him. And how are things to take care of him? It's things like doing meditation and yoga and coffee enemas and going to the spa and massages and gym, uh, going to the gym and eating good food and uh, going to sleep at a proper time, you know, like pretty basic stuff. Uh, going, you know, for a walk in the morning, you know, just get the blood flowing. And yeah, it's just made a massive difference. Like I'm here in Honduras right now. And in the old days for pretty much my whole life, I wouldn't have even done this interview because I'd be pretty hungover because I would have drank too much last night. And then I'd be depressed all day today and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And now I'm just not. And, and it just allows me to do so, so many more things and, and enjoy them as well. Yeah. And you mentioned you're there with your wife as well. I'm sure it's made this whole process has made an impact on your marriage, marriage too, right? Oh, big time. Yeah, we actually got remarried last year. Uh, wow. no, no government thing, just a commitment, of course. Yeah. Uh, but we got married originally about seven or eight years ago. And then we kind of like during my, the, the bad times where I was really depressed, we, we really, things weren't going well. But then I really made a commitment to fix myself and to fix everything in my life. And uh, yeah, it's made a huge difference. We got remarried again uh, last September. Uh, we're actually here in a honeymoon suite. So I'm calling it like all this year, anywhere we go is like a honeymoon, you know? Nice. So she, yeah, she's pretty happy. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I actually just followed her on Instagram the other day too. And I can tell she's loving life. So keep it up, man. It's That's good. Yeah, well, she told me something years ago, and it's totally true. And it's a, it's a saying, it's happy wife, happy life. And uh, if, if your wife or your partner, whoever it is that you're with, if they're not happy, it's not good. Uh, yeah. And so and that's another thing, too. So and, and not just taking care of myself, but also making the effort. It's about effort. And, you know, to be in a long term relationship takes a lot of work. And so I actually put in the work with her now. And now she's really happy and when she's really happy i've got no major problems uh and so then i'm happy so it's, it all works out yeah that's great that's great to hear all right so one one quick one more quick recap on anarchapulco and then i've got some fun questions for you here to close this one out within the next three years we'll say what's your vision for anarchapulco where do you where do you see it oh man uh three years a long time i'm surprised how big it's grown i didn't expect it to grow like this uh at all three years it's really hard to say the the uh, basic premise, though, of an Arcapoco is to reach a point where we don't need to have the conference anymore. And, and that would mean that the entire world had woken up from this, whatever the heck happened over the last few hundred years, where they all believe in slavery <laughs> and abortion and wars. Uh, and hopefully people wake up and, and just, you know, um, realize what I, I know, which is self-ownership. You don't aggress against other people. And if we reach that point, we really won't need the conference anymore. So that's really the goal of the conference. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to take at least a few more years and maybe five or 10 or maybe 20, who knows um, so where, where it's going to be in three years. I really have no idea. I, I, I can't imagine all I really, uh, to me, the important thing is that we uh, just make sure that we do our best job we can every year. And that the most, that everyone who attends is really happy and, and just go from there. Uh, and that's what I do a lot in life. I don't plan too far ahead. It's just, you know, let's make sure the next one's really good and let just go from there. Yeah. And I know you've mentioned this before too. You don't believe in intellectual property. So, or maybe I said that wrong. You do or you don't. I, I don't even necessarily know the definition. I don't of believe, 
uh, that uh, you that the government should be enforcing intellectual property. Thank you. Um, That's what I was trying. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, because of that, anyone listening or who is a supporter of Anarchapulco, they could go start their own or do their own. Someone even did that a year or two ago in Portugal and did Anarcha Portugal. So, any quick message to anyone listening who's looking to create their own anarcho uh, brand, basically. Yeah, actually, there's been a number of uh, ones have started up. There was one called Anarcha Forco, which was the first one, which actually was in in Acapulco um, right after Anarchapulco. Um, But they had some problems last year. I don't really want to get into that at the moment. (laughs) And then uh, the first one that really spun off was Anarcha Portugal. And I I went and attended that. And there was a few hundred people there. That was quite good. And then um, I think the next one was... Maybe in Arkazona, which I just attended a few months ago. I was in um, somewhere in Arizona, oh, Sedona. Uh, and then there's uh, one coming up called Anarcho Vegas, which is really interesting. They actually, uh, it's going to be right after Freedom Fest in Las Vegas oh, in wow. uh, July. And uh, they booked at the uh, D Hotel, uh, which was the first hotel, I think, in the world or in Vegas that started to accept Bitcoin a number of years ago. And uh, they actually uh, got shut down just recently by the hotel. So the hotel said, we hear you have Larkin Rose speaking and we hear he's a terrorist, which is hilarious because <laughs> all the guy talks about oh, is he's just so, he's, a, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so they actually got uh, the hotel broke their contract with them, but they're still going to have the event uh, and but they're keeping it in the secret location for now so they don't get shut down again. <laughs> and then there's another one coming up in Philadelphia, I believe in September called Anarchadelphia. So wow. yeah, for anyone out there, like I've always said, start up your own if you want, uh, if I'm able to attend um, and help you promote it, I will. Um, Anarchapoco isn't about having a conference that makes a lot of money and that we are in it for the money. We're in it because we want the, this this movement to spread. And if anyone else wants to start another one anywhere in the world, I think that's awesome. And I'll try to support it however I can. I love it. I love it. All right, Jeff. Uh, here we go. Three three fun questions for you here. I'm really looking forward to to all of them, but some this first one more than, than the others, I think. So I'd like to know, uh, one, what is your favorite thing about Canada? Your home, your homeland. Two, your favorite cryptocurrency right now, and three, your favorite part about your event in Acapulco. <laughs> uh, Canada. Um, well, I have to say, um, there's a number of good restaurants in Canada. I do enjoy some of the restaurants. Uh, I love hockey. Uh, I'm a huge hockey fan, and there's no better place to watch hockey than in Canada. And uh, what else do I like about Canada? Are, are you an Oilers fan? Yeah, I'm, I'm still an Oilers fan. It's been a tough 20 years or so. But, <laughs> Uh, but I still love hockey. It's awesome. And um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, uh, the mountains and stuff are really nice in Canada. It's just too cold and too communist for me uh, and, and things like that. Uh, my favorite cryptocurrency at the moment, uh, well, there's a bunch, but uh, one that definitely uh, I, I really like more and more almost every day is Monero. And the reason is it's focused on privacy. And I think that's really key. Uh, a lot of people are bringing up with Bitcoin how uh, really every transaction is pretty much totally traceable, uh, mm-hmm. unless you're really smart. Uh, and, uh, you know, with all these governments in the world and all their extortion rackets, you know, if everyone just gets into Bitcoin and every transaction is easily trackable, uh, then it means it's easily taxable. And I don't want that at all. I don't want to support uh, these criminal organizations with any kind of money. Uh, so I, for that reason, I really like Monero. I think they're, they're the most focused on privacy at the moment. Would you say my favorite thing about an Poco? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. It's a tough uh, one, I know. Yeah, it's tough. I'd probably just go back to what I said earlier with the people. Without the people, obviously, it wouldn't exist, but it really is. Like when you walk into the lobby of the, we have it at the Princess Hotel for the last uh, two years, and and it's probably going to be there again next year. We're just in in negotiations with the hotel. Um, When you walk into the lobby and you see hundreds of voluntarists and any table you sit down at, it's just amazing conversations. And this goes on all week. So, yeah, I enjoy it probably for the same reasons that most people enjoy it. And uh, just being around a lot of interesting people uh, who are all doing interesting things in their own ways, whether it be they're involved in the cryptocurrency space, which hopefully will get rid of central banks, which will hopefully get rid of governments, uh, or they're doing 
you know, any number of different things, uh, you know, podcasts or writing books or, or spreading information one way or another. Really, just let, just same reason that everyone says they love it is the same reason as I love it because I, there's no other place like it uh, where you can go. Like I go to some, I'll be at Freedom Fest, for example, and uh, it's mostly status. It's about 80% status. It used to be about 99% status, so that's changing. Of course, afterwards, be at Narco Vegas, but it, it's very small, right? It'd be 100 people right. or something. So there's really nothing like it where you can go and there's thousands of really amazing people that you just hang out with all week. All right. Well, hey, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. What is the best way for anyone listening or watching right now to follow up and get in touch with you? Uh, well, don't drop by my house. I've had that happen a few times, especially with my walking box. People actually Google oh. Maps. Uh, you know, I don't appreciate people coming to my house. Uh, but uh, no, you can just follow me on uh, just go YouTube, Dollar Vigilante. Uh, we've got our podcast, Anarchast, uh, there as well. And basically just our website, dollarvigilante.com or uh, narcoboco.com. Uh, get on the mailing list for them too because... I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if all of them are kicked off of things like Facebook and YouTube soon. So that'll be the only way that we can keep in contact with people soon. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. Love it. Jeff, thanks, thanks once again. Thanks for the, uh, the impact you're making on the world. And as I mentioned, even in my own life, I hope to see you at Freedom Fest again this year. And again, hopefully we can bring some, some more non-statists to Freedom Fest as well. Thank you, man. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Dream Chasers, Interviews with the Future. We will catch you in the next episode. And remember, in all you think, say, and do, take it to the next level.